How's it going and welcome to No Fun Lads Guide Series on Candlekeep Key Mysteries, a 5th edition module. In today's video we'll be taking a look at the adventure, the Canopic Being. We're going to be opening up a can of worms with this one, so players do not watch this as there will be spoilers. But DMs that want that added insight, go ahead and stick around because we have a lot to cover. And here our adventure begins with your players in Candlekeep. This is a 13th level adventure so we're getting into the ridiculously high tier stuff. Your players start off in Candlekeep and they are going to be approached by an individual which is going to lead them spiraling down into a weird creepy mystery involving actually the players which is unique. Your players are going to be met by one Eli Avianmore who is going to tell them that there is something weird going on. Eli is going to show them the book, The Canopic Being, and she's going to describe to them, yeah, this book's all about the ritual of becoming a mummy, yada yada, this and that, willing sacrifices, oh, by the way, your names are in this book. This book is creepy, there's a whole bunch of eyes that are looking around constantly, and your players will learn of weird dark rituals to potentially become a mummy, one of which involves willing sacrifices. So not only are the names of your player characters in the final part of this book, but also the missing scholar that your players are going to be sent to find. So hopefully right there, that is more than enough to get your players interested in what the heck is going on here. We've got a mummy, this book apparently was stolen, and your players have their names in the book. Eli Avianmore is going to ask the party to go to the city of Tashluda to investigate what the heck is going on here. And if you know anything about the geography, Tashluda is very far away. So you could theoretically have a scenario where your players have to go there on foot or they fly or whatever. But to keep things super simple, you can just have them teleport there. Before we get any further with the video though, I just want to give a huge shout out to all my amazing patrons up here. You guys are helping me out so very much. Thank you. Absolutely incredible. Thank you for all the amazing stuff that you're doing. I am putting out some content as well, and stay tuned on Patreon because I am going to be announcing some fun Candlekeep stuff going on over there. Once your players arrive in Tashluda, they will discover that this place is very, very keen on portenting the future. Everyone's got eyeball tattoos on their forehead, everyone tries to claim that they have some divination powers, and they worship Savras. Heading inside of the temple, your players will find a one Sheer Endilion, who is the head priest here. She will tell the players a very good amount of information here in all these bullet points about how, one, she saw them coming, and two, all this other great stuff in regards of, oh yeah, other people have come here, and how Valin lives in her secret sanctum. Oh yeah, and also some people have showed up here and they haven't returned, so maybe you guys can go ahead and check that out. Getting to the Sanctum isn't something that everyone can do, but Sheer can just show the players the way to go. Behind the temple and making their way inside, the portal will open up to the players where they can hop in. And it's here where we get some great information about the villain of this adventure, Valen. Valen wishes to usurp Savras, and the way she's doing that is trying to obtain immortality by becoming a mummy lord, and then figuring out the rest from there. What I really like about this adventure is you can really play in to foretelling and foreshadowing the future to come. You can have a lot of key moments where if you have this as part of a big long campaign, then you can maybe drop some hints about what's to come, maybe try and throw in some predictions on how PCs are going to die, etc, etc. And here it is, the tomb of Valen Sarnaster. This place is absolutely massive geographically. There is a decent amount of things to going on here, but man oh man, are your players going to be walking quite a ways. Some things to note about the tomb here is, as your players make their way inside, this place isn't just sheer boring walls and walking down hallways. No, you should describe the lack of gravity here, about how the crystal walls mesh with a weird transparentness and as people look outside of the temple's demiplane and beyond they see a shifting space of glowing crystals make sure that this place feels alien and strange and unique and it's here where we also get some great information about Valen's victims how they died and what happens if we want to bring them back to life and how we can replace what is lost which is their organs and speaking of those organs, here we get a list of the canopic golems, about where the organs are transplanted. We have the eyes in area 5, we have the nerves and kidneys in area 6, 
We have uh, the pancreas in area 7, however that was destroyed. And last, but most important of all, is the heart. The heart, however, is not in a canopic golem yet. The heart is located in Alessia Basir, who is, in fact, still alive, still kicking, and most unfortunate of all, is a good person who is unwitting pawn in this whole scheme. In the tomb features here, we also get some great detail about what you should describe to your players when they're going through this. Most important of all is the eyes of Savras. The walls of the tomb are adorned with decorative eyes that allow Valen to see through it, meaning that Valen can essentially see the majority of this location. In area 1, we have the portal. Your players pop out, and there inside, they'll see Alicia Basir. Alicia is going to say, hey, how's it going? I'll show you around. You guys are obviously here for a reason. You can make your way inside. So Alicia is a very kind and trusting person. That is, in fact, her flaw, that she is too trusting. And if your players say, hey, we know that Valen's up to no good, she's going to say, no, that's not true. She's been doing some great stuff. You can go ahead and talk to her yourself. Also, something very important to note is your players can be told, yeah, those other people came through quite some time ago, but she will say, oh, yeah, we're in an extra dimensional space and time moves differently here. So however long it was in the outside world may not reflect how long it's been in here. So hopefully you don't have a bunch of murder hobos on you. Hopefully you have some people that are willing to talk and negotiate and see what's up. Alicia is just going to be forthcoming and truthful with what she knows. And she will tell the players, oh yeah, if you go down there, that's a bit dangerous. Don't touch that, don't do this. But you can make your way inside. With suitable role playing or a high persuasion check, she can guide them through area 3, which is the mirror room. But after that, she will simply return to her private quarters in area 2. Alicia also keeps the key to her quarters and the portal door around her neck. In area 2 we have Alicia's quarters. She can show this off to the players if they desire because they have free reign of the area. She can show off, oh yeah, you know, I've got some food in here if you need it, food and drink. I, we can talk a bit, we can see what's up. Hopefully your players don't press too hard into the whole Valen's a bad guy thing because she'll probably get a little ticked off at some point. In area 3 we have the Mirrors of Fortune. Once your players make their way inside of here, they will see that there is walls of perfect mirrors, and this is going to give it a fun house feeling. However, this is not so fun if your players touch any of the mirrors, as they have to make a DC 20 dexterity saving throw as they meander about this maze, and if they fail touching one of the mirrors, they take 4 D10 points of psychic damage. Pretty gnarly stuff. Now, if your players fail, they have to keep on rolling until they succeed, and presumably people are not going to want to keep on trying this if they are bad at dexterity saving throws. But if they do in fact succeed, and they actually take no damage at all, then they are gifted with a beautiful blessing that gives them a d8 to add to any d20 roll they make in the next 24 hours. If your players have Alicia guiding them here, then they'll have advantage on those dexterity saving throws, which will be pretty powerful. Located inside of this room, your players can, with a DC 25 perception check, find a nice little meditation room that has two potions of superior healing, which will be pretty useful because they're probably going to take a bunch of damage. And as well, they can also find this hidden hallway with a DC 20 perception check, and that is going to take them all around the backside of this tomb. In area 4, we have the testing chambers. Located inside of here is a dais, and located inside of which is the hilt of a sword. If your players want to get the hilt of the sword, which is a sun sword, then they need to bash it down. However, if they go to bash the thing down, two Dao are going to appear and attack the party. I always like when these modules give us some kind of guide on how the creature attacks in the beginning, as it states that these two Dao are going to cast Phantasmal Killer, and then go in with their mauls. Now, of course, if your players want to get their hands on the Sun Sword, they're going to have to bust the dais, they're going to have to beat down the Dao, and then, eventually, they're going to have to try and reach in for it. When you do go and reach for it, you have to make a DC 16 Intelligence Saving Throw or take 4d6 points of Psychic Damage on a failure or half as much on a success. Character wearing gloves, however, has advantage on the save. This fight will be worth it, as from the two Dao, you will be given two necklaces worth 2,500 GP each. Woohoo! And in addition to that, the Sunblade. And that Sunblade is going to be a powerhouse against any undead. If your players run away from this fight and try and return later, unfortunately for them, they will find that one hour later, the dais is going to repair itself, 
in addition to that any DAO that were not destroyed are going to pop back up at full health. In area 5 we have the scrying pool, your players make their way inside of here and there they'll see a canopic golem. What's really cool is Valen is going to talk through this canopic golem and try and lead the party into an ambush, which I always find is pretty awesome. But if your players are headlong and get into combat, then combat's going to ensue. Mind you, combat is actually not good here because these canopic golems are insanely strong. So first off, looking at the stats of the canopic golem, the 17 AC, pretty decent, not that great at 13th level, but whatever. 252 HP, that is actually a big deal. Their damage output, pretty strong. But what really makes these things super deadly is the limited spell immunity. The golem automatically succeeds on any saving throw against spells of 7th level or lower, and attack rolls of such always miss. In addition to that, there's also the spell deflection. In response to a spell attack missing the golem, it causes the spell to hit another creature within 120 feet of it that it can see. So normally at this stage of the game, the high level casters love casting their spells and doing all the damage and stuff, but if they are casting low level spells, then they are going to be in for a terrible time as not only are they going to be not hitting the golem, but they're also going to be hitting their friends or maybe even themselves. And as a friendly reminder, cantrips are spells too. They're basically zeroth level spells. So no cantrips, no first through seventh level spells here. The magic casters are going to be crying. What I really like here though is the Kanava golem is not going to fight to the death. Once it reaches 30 HP, it is going to try and run to area 6 to lure the party into that ambush. If characters spend one whole minute in this area, they must make a DC 15 constitution saving throw or take 46 points of poison damage. In addition to that, the pool itself is boiling water. Any creature that starts to turn in the water takes 8d8 points of fire damage. And creature that drinks this water must make a DC 15 con saving throw or be poisoned for one hour. But something very cool to note here is people that are observant can see that this thing produces holy water, but it has been corrupted. If anybody spends one minute trying to undo the corruption on the runes with a DC-19 Arcana check, they can revert it. After one whole hour, it will now be holy water. And this is doubly cool because if the holy water now is restored and flowing through, anyone that spends a minute here meditating can earn basically a portent roll. You roll a d20 and you can use that roll any time in the next day. Inside of this room is a small cabinet, and if your players pick the lock or they bash it open, they can find a whole bunch of gold worth of trinkets as well as a crystal ball of true seeing. And also something very important to note is a scroll describing the rite of reclamation. In area 6 we have the false tomb. Your players may just stumble into this area or they may be led here astray, and unfortunately for them, they're going to find that this place is a deathly trap. The two canopic golems are going to attack the party at once. And in addition to that, they will also hear belittling and berating coming from the sarcophagus in the pit. Valen is trying to lure the party into the trap of going down there and of course getting themselves killed. Hopefully your players hold off on that. Hopefully they are smart enough to see through her ruse. But if they aren't, then hopefully they have enough HP to not die. Located in here is the Canopic Gallery, which will include all of the missing organs. This is going to be incredibly useful because if someone wants to have the happy ending here, then they need to use the organs here. So not only do your players have to go up against not one, but two of these deathly canopic golems, which are essentially going to be basically taking a lot longer to kill because your magic users aren't really doing too much. But your players then are probably going to be goaded into descending down into the sarcophagus. This is a hundred foot drop and your players are going to come up with a number of ways to go down there, whether that's just rope or they jump or they, whatever the case may be. When they go down, however, once they get within 20 feet of the coffin, a glyph is going to kick off, causing a stinking cloud to erupt from all around, rising 30 feet up, which is going to inevitably engulf the person that was 20 feet away for at least one round. And once your players finally overcome that stinking cloud, then they can go down and try and lift open the sarcophagus lid. The thing weighs 550 pounds, so pretty heavy, but if they're able to push it off, each creature within 5 feet of the sarcophagus that is not a construct or undead must make a DC 17 Christmas saving throw or take 6d8 necrotic damage on a failed save or half as much on a success. 
this war resets when the lid of the sarcophagus is closed again inside of which is nothing so the inside of the sarcophagus is empty it's just nothing but what i would have there is to give some flavor to this i would have an eye just simply staring back at the party and i would have valen laugh as the party gets presumably damaged by all this stuff. Located inside of some of the canopic jars, we have Eyes of Minute Seeing and an eye patch set with a sapphire and moonstone eye, which is 2,500 GP. That's a crazy expensive eye patch. In area seven, we have the meditation room. Your players can find in here the body of Mayastin Sadar, who didn't like what was going on here and decided to end their own life. Flipping over the body, your players can find out that the person was disemboweled, pretty gnarly stuff. And with a DC 20 medicine check, your players can recognize the stone shape on the ground being a pancreas. If your players haven't already picked up how to slay a mummy lord, then fortunately enough for them, located on her body, your players will find a sheet of paper that has the instructions. They have to destroy the heart. In area 8, we have the antechamber. This place is pretty boring. There's really nothing going on here. It's just the room before the big room. In Area 9, however, we have the Observatory of Fate. Located inside of here, Valen is waiting for the party, and she will make her defiant stand. Something cool to note here is that there is an unusual gravity located in here, and at the start of the combat that is inevitably going to ensue, Everybody in the room has to make DC 15 dexterity checks, and if they fail, then they're going to have disadvantage as they're somewhat floating around the place. But once they finally succeed, then they are growing acclimated to it. We get a nice little blurb about what Valen's going to say to the party as they approach, and then the fight is inevitably going to ensue. Something cool to note, though, is Valen will challenge the characters, and she will be saying, I've seen your futures, I know you will be defeated, and I know what you've done. Another very cool thing to note here is Fate's Boon. All creatures in the room experience glimpses of the immediate future. At the start of the second round of whatever is going on here, each creature in the room can use a bonus action to focus on the future, granting advantage on the next attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. Note, that's all creatures, which includes Valen, so that's kind of a big deal here. Once a creature uses this boon, it can't do so again until they finish a long rest. So, what I'm going to tell you all is, of course, the room is awesome. You can describe it as this infinite floating space with eyes floating all around. You can talk about the lack of gravity here and things going out of control, the glimpse of the future. The setting is just incredible. Here's the issue, though. Mommy Lords natively have 97 HP. So what that means is, at level 13, she will not survive a single round. It's not going to happen. At 13th level, your players are going to have immense amounts of resources. They're going to be able to blow her out of the water. I've heard from many, many different people that have already ran this, that paladins armed with the Sun Sword are going to basically just one-shot her just by themselves. And that's not including the rest of the party, who's presumably got their own set of crazy stuff. So, yes, it's cool where we get this mummy lord who gets these cool abilities and all these spells. But I'm going to tell you, the 97 HP is worthless. It's going to last a single round, and if you roll bad on the initiative, which realistically could happen because she has a plus nothing to her initiative, then there's a very good chance she doesn't even get to do anything. So what I'll tell you is, you can beef up her stats so that there is an actual badass, awesome boss battle to be had here. But at the same time, her being the villain of this adventure isn't necessarily the be-all, end-all. Because one, the canopic golems are incredibly deadly by themselves. And two, the real threat isn't the fact that it's just a mummy lord. It's the fact that she will keep coming back unless the players ultimately destroy her. And the only way they can ultimately destroy her is by destroying her heart, which is located inside of a good person's body. So should you beef up this boss encounter? Yes or no? I, you know, it comes down to the kind of game that you run. One, never run bosses by themselves. It never works out. So if you did want to beef up this encounter, a real simple solution here is to add the canopic golems to this room, whether that just be one or maybe two to this room, to actually give Valen a fighting chance. Another obvious solution here is to increase her HP by maybe two or maybe even three times because level 13 players are just going to pump in all the resources. Make sure that there is something rewarding and satisfying 
of this fight. Another recommendation I could have to this fight being awesome and climactic is having it that the gravity is ever going. It doesn't matter if they succeed on the check. There's just always a disadvantage on attack rolls because people are floating around here bouncing off the walls. I think that's perfectly fine. There's a lot of ways you can beef up this encounter, should you desire. I don't think you need it, depending on the sort of style adventure that you want to tell and run. But if you do want that big, awesome, epic boss battle at the end, then I would strongly recommend having there be some cronies at the side and some changes to the engagement entirely. If Valen is reduced to zero HP, then she will call out, I have lessons yet to teach you, but you will learn, and she will come back because she has a possibility of coming back. Unless she doesn't, if your players have already destroyed the heart, then she will call out, fate defies me, so be it. But though you defeat me, I promise you will not survive the future I have seen. You know, that is awesome foreshadowing, foretelling of what is to come if you're running a full-blown campaign. Even if it's a one-shot, I think there's definitely some cool, ominous things to be had with that. In addition to that, once your players deal with Valen, they will be given a Hat of Disguise, which is a diadem, which is probably a lot better looking than a Hat of Disguise as well as the Adamantine Key, which opens up Area 10. In Area 10, we have the Treasure Room. Your players can open this thing up with a key, but if they try and open up the door in any other way, whether they bash it down or they break the lock, they can do those and make their way inside. However, if you use any process that is not the key, the Glyph of Warding will activate, causing everyone to make a DC 17 Dex 30 saving throw or take 7 D8 Thunder damage. Inside of this room, your players will find a whole bunch of cool items worth of gold, but most important of all is a ring of spell storing with Bless and Revivify stored away inside. Pretty awesome stuff. In addition to that, they will also find an Ioun Stone of Awareness, the Staff of Fate, and the Watchful Helm really really powerful items the last two of which are actually brand new and we'll be taking a look at those right now the staff of fate is a plus three quarter staff which is pretty dope in addition to that it also essentially is a free bless that you can give to any one person at a time as you can expand the charge and give someone a d4 that they can use to add to an ability check an attack roll a damage roll or a saving throw before the start of the next turn pretty cool stuff and we also have the Watchful Helm, which is a plus one to your AC and gives you advantage on perception checks, as well as giving you the bonus action of casting Sea Invisibility, because no one ever prepares Sea Invisibility, so this one will be quite useful. In Area 11, we have the Observatory of History. Your players can make their way inside of here going through all the other locations, and in here they will see visions of the past. As an action, a character can use the room to replay up to 10 minutes from the past. However, this comes with a detriment. They must make a DC 20 intelligence saving throw or get the following flaw. I obsess about the past and I'm constantly trying to go back to undo my mistakes. This totally reminds me of that mirror in Harry Potter as people would sit in this thing and probably try and think of the past over and over and over again. That is definitely bad news. But I like this room. It's very fitting. It's very in theme of what's going on here. And something cool to note is there is that lack of gravity in here. What I would recommend is if your players show up to here before they get into that main room with Valen, then perhaps they get adjusted to the gravity a bit better, or maybe they can just float around here and have a great time. So with concluding this adventure, your players can come in here, they can ransack this tomb, steal all the goodies, beat Valen. But if they do not destroy her heart, they haven't actually solved anything. She's just going to come back, right? So your players need to deal with the heart. And that's honestly the biggest part of this whole thing. Your players have to do something about that heart, which is really unfortunate because that could mean they potentially kill someone that's innocent. So hopefully your players gather enough clues to figure out how to do the ritual. Hopefully your players come up with something creative here because... If they do figure out, okay, we know that there's all these organs, we destroy all these canopic golems, but there's one organ left, the heart, and they know that it is in that dear assistant, then they have to do something about it. They know that the Mummy Lord is going to return. So your players are going to have a number of things to think about here. If they didn't actually research anything at all whatsoever and just blew everything off, then maybe they just walk away after defeating Valen, and then Valen returns. 
And hey, if your players do not kill Valen, then Valen could be an awesome recurring villain where <laughs> they can't do anything about it because they don't know what to do. And then eventually they can learn, okay, we need to destroy the heart. Where is it? And then they can find that through some other adventure. Word of Myastin Sadar's death is going to hurt the scholars of Candlekeep, but Myastin could potentially be brought back to life using a resurrection, or perhaps the body is too damaged to ever return. If your players are able to actually save Alicia and at the same time destroy Valen, then Alicia will either go back to the Temples of Ross, or maybe take up a job in Candlekeep, or maybe even become the party's friend. There's a lot of great things to be had with that. I think Alicia is a fun NPC to roleplay as because she is trusting, and people that are too trusting can be manipulated, and manipulating people is what we do as DMs, right? This adventure is fun. It's a nice little dungeon delve. This place isn't super duper heavy on the combats and doesn't need to be. The exploration's fun and there's a lot of great world building to be had here. The NPCs you get to interact with are great. This is just a fun adventure all around. Your players get to interact with the villain in a meaningful manner and if they don't do the thing to save Alicia, then they're going to have guilty consciences perhaps. There's a lot of things going on for this thing that just make it totally awesome. So go ahead and tell me, are your players going to be able to storm in here and beat Valen and save the day easy peasy? Or do you think your players are going to miss the whole destroying the heart thing and have to come up with some other idea? Is your party full of fighters and barbarians that don't care about the golem's magic resistance? Or is your party so magic dependent that your party is going to cry when they go up against these things? And will Alicia join the parties in future adventures or will she be smart and not hang out with those weirdos? Go ahead and tell me all those things because I want to know, but that's going to do it for me. Thank you for watching, thanks for listening, and thank you to my amazing patrons. You guys are absolutely incredible, thank you so very much, and I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.